Um, so yeah, Leah did a, a fantastic job last week uh, introducing kind of what we're going to be getting into. And, and like I said, I, I had to duck out, so I, I caught it on YouTube. Um, if you guys have not uh, been a part of this series, I, I encourage you to, to do that because it'll, it'll kind of help you get grounded, I think. It, it's very well worth it. The, the series is actually very important to us, uh, incredibly important to us, not just as, as the vineyard, but as us as a local church. I've, I've said for a number of months, if you recall, way back before Advent, way back before all the series last year, that I kept trying to get to it a time to speak about the activity of the Holy Spirit. And it kept getting told no. So we talked about the fruit of the Spirit. We, we talked about Advent. We talked about all these other things. And every time I kept going to that well thinking, Lord, this is what I think our church needs, he kept saying no. And it was very troubling to me because I think this is what our church needs. <laughs> and, and he kept pushing that off. And then Vineyard USA came and they said that they wanted us to do this together. So the, the way that this whole thing lined up is, is kind of great. I, I can see it being prophetic and something that the Lord's leading us to. But this is like our bread and butter, y'all. Like, this is the, our heritage. Th this is so important to us. Like, why are we here in this room instead of, you know, with our thousands of neighbors right down the road? You know, what are the things that have been awakened in our souls that, that make us a distinct and unique people? What has the Lord stirred for us to be, not just to the community, but us as a distinct flavor in the body of Christ? You know, why did he tell Leah and I to plant a church in Holly Springs amongst all the other churches there. What is going on? It, hopefully, it's going to become evident through the series. Th this is something that makes us unique. Um, it brings, I hope, the authority and power that the church desperately needs to, to be the presence of God in the world that, that we want. And that's not to say that we're more special or, or better or anything. It, it's just something that I think comes to help add that. If every, if every meal is super filled with salt, it's not a good meal, right? But you need that, that for a full expression of what the kingdom of God is. And I thank God that the kingdom of God is a broad place. It's a wonderful place. That there's lots of, of participating churches, and we are a part of that. And we are a vineyard, and we're vineyard for a reason. And that's because when we read Scripture, we understand and we see that the activity of the Holy Spirit is continuing. And it's a great joy to be participants in that work. Um, so this series to me is an answer to this question. And th this is kind of a follow-up from what we had on Easter. What is my personal lived experience? And I'm talking about Josh here. You can insert your name. What is your personal lived experience that testifies to the resurrection of Jesus Christ of Nazareth? That actually says it happened. What is your lived experience that says, I know Jesus was raised from the dead? This is my lived experience. This isn't just an eyewitness testimony that I read in a book. My personal lived experience is that I know Jesus of Nazareth was, was raised from the dead. And how do I know that the Holy Spirit of God, God in fullness, dwells in his people today as Jesus promised? How do we know those things are true? How do we experience those things? How do we live those things out? What's the impact of those things in a world that needs to know that these things are true? That's what this series is, is about. Do you have that experience? Do you have that testimony? Is it something that you can point your finger to, or are you still working that out? And that's what we're about. That's what we want you to be able to be participants for. I hope that you'll be able to answer that by the time we're done here. And I, I want to, Leah, Leah said this, I'm going to rephrase this in, in Josh language, um, that the, the Holy Spirit should be a proper noun and not an adjective. And now there's irony there, as I just said, Josh noun, yeah, Josh language, right? I just used my name as an adjective. <laughs> and that's kind of on purpose. That's what we do. When we talk about Holy Spirit activity, right? We're using that as an adjective, not as a noun. The activity of the Holy Spirit is a personification of him, right? It's an understanding that, that he is God incarnate, uh, that he's the fullness of God, that he, not incarnate, sorry, but he is God himself in fullness, that we have to come before him as a sovereign Lord. And what we often do is we think that it's, it's an adjective for that type of church or that type of thing. And it, it might be like, you sound like I'm being the, the grammar police here, but it, it's really not that because I think it betrays something of who we are and what we expect. If I'm saying I want to have a, a Holy Spirit experience, you're thinking, oh, he wants to have like, you know, people crying and laughing and falling down or, or whatever. But if I want to encounter the person, the Holy Spirit today, do you know what that means? Anything could happen. It might not be any of those things. It could be something completely unexpected because it's the sovereign Lord himself. 
Do, do you see what I'm saying? I, I think it matters that we understand that, that he, it is a proper noun and not an adjective for the type of ministry we, we, we want to do. When we talk about encountering the Holy Spirit and when we're sitting there in silence, it's not just like trying to feel the feels of the room. It's actively listening to God himself. <laughs> and that's a big deal, right? So whenever we're doing these things, that, that's kind of our hope, that, that we're not using this as an adjective, but it is a, a noun. So I, I already said it's Josh type of language, but I, I know that there's already language out in our church about the type of clothing that Josh wears, or, you know, it's the Josh type of greeting, which often means an awkward hug. <laughs> but all joking aside, right, when we use these things as, a, as an adjective, it limits us. It limits, it puts something in a box. And it says, I know what that thing is. I've already defined it. I already have an understanding for it. And when I use it in that way, it's the description of the thing, not an encountering of the thing itself. All right, so this week we're calling our attention to the Holy Spirit's work as a revealer. He is one who gives revelation. The Holy Spirit has a way of making the unknowable known. Pause on that, because that does not make sense. And, and you should understand that that is a big statement and not just a throwaway little, you know, two-cent line. The Holy Spirit makes the unknowable known. God is unknowable. He's beyond us. And the Holy Spirit's job as a revealer, one of the things he loves to do, the activity of the Holy Spirit, the things whenever he is doing his work in the church that we expect and we've understood him to do by history, by the testimony of Scripture, by our, our own lived experience, is that the Holy Spirit makes the unknowable known to us. That you can begin and continue the adventure of understanding something, of, of experiencing something, of learning something, of encountering something that is beyond our understanding. And, and that that's, doesn't make any sense at all. How can we know what's unknown? But we do, right? We begin to, to understand that there's a depth. We understand that there's a power. We understand that there's more to this story. We understand that God himself is somehow represented by this. God is unknowable, and yet we are called to know him. And it's not just that we're trying to hold two ideas at the same time, as some people try to talk about. It's not just that, that he's understood through paradox, you know, or the, all these logical things that we kind of talk about. It's not about that. It's more than that. It's not just that it's, it's more complicated than what we can understand or that there's secrets of the universe beyond us. It's all of those things and more, right? Anytime we try to put God in a box, the box is too small. Anytime we try to limit it, it's going to be too limiting, except when we look at Jesus himself, right? Except when we encounter the Holy Spirit, because that way we, we get this glimpse into something that just opens up into all that God is. And as soon as we put it into language, as soon as we try to, to make an image of it, we've brought it down to our level. So we can never get to the point where we say, oh, I understand God, where, I, oh, I understand all that Christ did for me. No, you don't. <laughs> you, you, you've gotten a glimpse of it. You've had a first step into it, but it just keeps going deeper and further and into a more wonderful way. And so we come to him with this, this hope for revelation that I can once again see how deep, how vast, how wide is his love for me. You know, that, that we can understand that this work that he began is going to continue beyond us, that we're a part of his story like we were talking about with communion, that, that there's something going on here that is way better than what any representation might be. The whole call in the Old Testament not to make a graven image is because of that whole thing. It's going to be a bad image. Have you ever seen a photo of yourself and you think, I don't look like that? <laughs> right? I think that often. <laughs> and, and it's because, you know, we're not that, right? We, we're, we're, we're three dimensional creatures working through the dimension of time, you know, and you want to get your good side and your bad, you know, like I'm going to be on the video here. And we want to make us look a certain way because we know that we're more than that one photo will show us. And that photo glimpses us with mustard on our face and our mouth open and like an eye half closed. And I don't look like that all the time. I want you to know me. Whenever we make a graven image, and it might not be a graven image in the sense of, of like out of stone or wood. It could just be in your imagination. Whenever we make that graven image, we've limited who God is. But it takes so much humility and active work to come before the Holy Spirit time and time again and saying, not as I would have you be, not limited by my understanding, but as you are, 
That's, that's what we're asking about. That's what we're about. Is all that you are, would you reveal that to me today? What are you doing today here in this space now with the people in this room? What are the works that you need to do in 2023 that haven't been done, that weren't possible 10 years ago? I've made the joke a lot that, that I think I would have been a fantastic pastor in 1995. <laughs> I, um, things were simpler, right? W weren't they simpler? Pre-COVID even, things were simpler. But the Lord knew that we'd be here in 2023. My calling to be a pastor has to account for what the Lord is doing here today. Or why did he even call us? Why did he call you together? What is he doing here today that he knew about that he wants us together in the same room to do to experience? So if God is to be known, we need help. <laughs> if God is to be known, we need help. And the Holy Spirit seems to really like to make God known. It seems to be one of his great joys. So in terms of revelation, if we wrestle with something or if we reason something out, then the results are often just going to be a reflection of our own mind in the mirror, right? If I'm just trying to apply logic, if I'm just trying to go through my own experience, what I'm going to see at the end of that is Josh's best understanding of what this thing looks like. And I look in the mirror and I see that. Emily actually had a great story in, in our, our Sunday school. I'm going to see how I slipped it in. About there's a YouTube channel apparently where artists give each other a description. They start to describe something and then the other artist has to try to draw it out. And at the end of the, of the experiment, they have to try to guess from their drawing what they were drawing. So I don't know if they were using characters like, you know, they say draw a circle with the ears and you try to get make them to draw a Mickey Mouse or whatever. You see at the end. Yeah. And, and so like... I feel like it, that's the idea that with our best efforts, do we recognize God at the end of this, right? If, if I'm telling you that, that, that he's loving, if I'm telling you that he's kind, that he's gentle, do you end up with a, a good picture of Jesus, or have we just made a cult of our own best understandings, right? If it is only human minds involved, we're not going to end up in a good place. We need the activity of the Holy Spirit to actually reveal who God is, or else we're just guessing, or else we're just trying to, to do our, our best imp impersonation of a God-like being. And instead, if we come with reverence and awe, we can see all that he is. So which one of us among us has not been uh, called to a test that you did not study for, and you pray that God would give you the answers? Right? Is it just me? Come on, we've all done this, right? You're like, oh no, that test is today. Dear Lord, help me for my lack of understanding here. And, and, and this idea of, of what the Lord is going to reveal to us, what is, what is he about, is I think something that we're prone to expect, right? We understand that we're limited. We understand that we have this acknowledgement, this need for something more and deeper beyond what we have. But before I go into this in depth, I want to have just a quick word about Revelation. Because again, it's not just lining our th ourselves up and reasoning things out. It's not just trying to come up with a, the best understanding that we possibly can. It's not like, I always use this, this uh, illustration, but we're not Googling for the answer. Like, what is God like? You put it in, oh, he's loving, he's kind, he's, he's generous, blah, 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 blah. And that's the top result. It's in the box, so we can just trust that and then just move on. I Google things for my job all the time, and I cannot remember them an hour after I look them up, Right? Because the, I haven't actually learned anything. I just referenced an answer, right? There's, there's no work. There's no internalization. There, there's no processing. It's just reference. It's just linking to something and being like, okay, there it is. I can fill in that answer on the test and I move on with my life. When the Spirit reveals something to us, it really awakens something in our soul that, that makes it go deep. As deep calls unto deep. Revelation is that like eye-opening wide experience of like, oh my goodness, now I see. Now I know. Now I get it. Like before I was guessing, but it makes sense now. When I work on this with my, my kids, right, at, at the dinner table after, you know, we've gone to, di after we've eaten dinner and they're trying to work on their homework and they need help with math and I have to pull out the old recesses of my brain where I learned how to do algebra or whatever it might be, right? And, and then th you see that moment, Teachers, I'm sure you've seen this, right, where they get it finally, where it's not just an idea, it's not just a, a rote exercise, but they understand why this works. There was a college class I took, and the, the very first day of the class, the professor had a, uh, a proof of why 1 plus 1 equals 2, and it was about 10 pages long, and he said, if you don't like that, you're not going to like this class, and I said, 
I'm going to drop this class. <laughs> True story. I didn't take that class after that day. Um, you know, but this idea of, of whenever we know something, not because it, it's just the answer, but we can reason out what it is and, and it, it resonates with us, that, that's a huge thing. So why does the Holy Spirit do this work? I've had a few experiences with this. Once I had a, a vision, actually, of, of my wife chatting with Jesus. Um, it was a wonderfully beautiful experience. Like, I, I didn't ask for this. I wasn't looking for this. But I just had this, this view of, of, her, of her just chatting with him. And, and I was like, what, what, what does, why? What, what, why are you showing me this, God? Like, what is it? And it, all it did, all it did, was deepen my appreciation for the communion that my wife had with our Creator. And it was this way of, of seeing her from his eyes. You know, and, and the, the thing that I love about this revelation, that there's something that I believe is true, and I talked to her about, like, what her prayer times are like. We're not a couple, by the way, that, like, reads Proverbs for couples together and then compares notes and we spend, you know, an hour in quiet time together. That, that, it never worked for our marriage. If that works for yours, fantastic. But, you know, it, it, uh, it gave me such a confidence in her as a, as a pastor, as a woman of God, as, as a woman after God's heart, who has a relationship that is sweet and affectionate and kind and, and that just shows the depth of intimacy. And, and it, it caused me to see her in such a way that, that has deepened my love for her and my respect for her whenever she, she shares things with me. It's like, oh, well, you were talking with God about this. I know what that's like because the Lord showed me what that's like for you. And so on the other hand of that, so we have this almost passing, like, nice, you know, revelation but I also believe in the weight and the power of God whenever there's like a heavy weight on your soul and something's been revealed to you that you know is going to change everything, right? That this isn't just something I can forget about. This isn't something trivial that I can kind of like maybe think about, but maybe not. But I know that this is like something lodged in the throat of my soul that if I don't process this correctly, who knows where I'm going to end up. And that's because the word of God is bold and powerful and it changes things. So when things are revealed to us, there's like, it could be anything. It could be anything along that scale. Um, a big idea in scripture, though, is that there is always a revealing, that there's always a witnessing, and there's always a testifying. We're not quite there yet. <laughs> I think the why is important because it reminds me that God does things not because he needs to do things, but because it's who he is. Right? What I, I think when we think that the Lord is always about trying to do something deeper, then we're going to mistake the fact that he's a loving father. If we think that he's just like a CEO trying to get work done, right, then we're going to forget the fact that he's a good friend. We're going to forget that he's a counselor. We're going to forget that he cares for us, that he would seek us out. And if we think that he only seeks us out, he's only, only there to tend my wounds, we forget the fact that he is the boss in charge of all things. So whenever the Holy Spirit is revealing things to us, I think we have to understand, again, the sovereignty of God is all along that. What he has for me today might be wholly different than what it is tomorrow. What he says to Chris could be very different than what he says to Adrian. And that's a good thing. We should celebrate that and understand that fully. He doesn't need us to accomplish his plans, but he chooses us and invites us to join him. We don't need an understanding to follow him, but it builds our relationship to know him better. I think we are plagued in the church by an understanding of God as one or the other. That he's either a cosmic force of nature or he's a philosophical approach to a, a well-lived life, that he, that he is a, a, a dictator, that, that he's, you know, fill in the blank without understanding that he is beyond all of those things. When we lose the personhood of God, when we lose the personhood of the, the Holy Spirit, the likes, the dislikes, the choices to and the choices to not, we lose something of who he is. So this idea of revelation is so important that we actually encounter and see him as he is. Um, this is an opinion, what I'm about to say now, so you can, you can drop this part. Maybe from the recording we can drop this part. But I think that, that the prophetic being a gift is different than the work of the Holy Spirit being a revealer. Okay? What I mean by that is what I, I've experienced and what I understand is that we can operate in the prophetic sometimes with a little bit of autonomy, which is a surprising thing to me. Like, why would he trust us that much? But we don't have that luxury when it comes to the Holy Spirit revealing things to us, or else our imagination will lead us awry. So I see those things as kind of distinct. So even though it sounds like I'm talking about the prophetic, I'm actually kind of not. All right, it, it matters that they are related. Hopefully the prophetic 
comes with the work of the Holy Spirit and the revealing, and it's in line, but I, I have a, a slight distinction for me in that. Um, revelation, I'll argue, sometimes leaves us in awe. Like, that's what it does. You get a, a glimpse of Jesus, and you're in awe. And the prophetic has some work to produce from that. Now, I won't, I'll, you could say that the being in awe is a work. You're true. Very true. I'm not going to argue with you on that. Good point. But I think that there's a, a distinction there. All right, so the Holy Spirit reveals an unknowable God to us. Revealing Jesus, now we've got this one, revealing scripture and revealing what the Father is doing. Um, real quick, going through this, um, this, this, is, this is like the, the cliff notes so you know I'm not making this stuff up. All right, I'm going to give you a blitz through these things so we can understand. Um, and I'm going to hit what I hope is going to be challenging for us. In revealing Jesus, Ephesians 1, 17, I keep asking that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that you may know him better. I mean, okay, do I need to give you any other scriptures? I mean, that's kind of the point, right? That's an amazing thing that's tying the Trinity together in this idea of saying, this is why I want you to know better. Like, I, I want you to, to understand this better. So making Jesus known, making the Father known, understanding this. Uh, Paul, I've been talking about this one so much because I, I read it recently and it's just been resonating. Um, you know, who are you, Lord? You know, on the road to Damascus, I am Jesus who you're persecuting. He made the Lord known. Like, that's such a big deal is that we have this encounter and revealing who Jesus is. Uh, Peter in Matthew 16, when Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say the Son of Man is? They replied, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others, Jeremiah or one of the prophets. But what about you, he asked, who do you say I am? Simon Peter answered, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. And Jesus replied, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah. For this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but by my father in heaven. Can we see Jesus clearly? Do we know him or do we put him in one of these other boxes, right? Is it this understanding that, that you are more than what they say you are, that you're more than that? Can we have an encounter with him today that reveals who he is or are we demeaning who Jesus is. So we need the activity of the Holy Spirit to reveal Jesus. All right, next one. I told you it was going to be a blitz. Uh, revealing scripture from 1 Corinthians 2. Uh, this is a, a bigger chunk for us. We do, however, speak a message of wisdom among the mature, but not the wisdom of this age or the rulers of this age who are coming to nothing. No, we declare God's wisdom, a mystery that has been hidden and that God destined for our glory before time began. None of the rulers of this age understood it, for if they had, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. However, as it is written, what no eye has seen, what no ear has heard, and what no human mind has conceived, the things God has prepared for those who love him. These things God has revealed to us by his spirit. And now that's an amazing thing. The unknowable things, the things that you can't see or not, they're being made known to us by his spirit. So the spirit searches all things, even the deep things of God. For who knows a person's thoughts except their own spirit within them? In the same way, no one knows the thoughts of God except the Spirit of God. What we have received is not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit who's from God, so we may understand what God has freely given us. This is what we speak, not in words taught to us by human wisdom, but in words taught by the Spirit, explaining spiritual realities with Spirit-taught words. Wow. The person without the Spirit does not accept the things that come from the Spirit of God, but considers them foolishness cannot understand them because they are discerned only through the Spirit. The person with the Spirit makes judgments about all things, but such a person is not subject to merely human judgments. For who has known the mind of the Lord so as to instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. A lot of words, but I think it really tells us so clearly, right, that it's different than what we understand it to be. It, it's a necessary way that if we want to understand all of this stuff, if we understand how Scripture tells the story, if we want to understand what the Father is doing, if we want to see the Spirit himself, we need the Holy Spirit to reveal this to us. There, there's no other path. There's no other way of knowing these things that are unknowable and unable to be experienced by the natural paths of this world. All right, finally, revealing what the Father is doing, John 14. Jesus replied, anyone who loves me will obey my teaching. My Father will love them, and he will come to them and make our home with them. Anyone who does not love me will not obey my teaching. These words you hear are not my own. They belong to the Father who sent me. All this I have spoken while still with you. But the Advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, 
will teach you all things and will remind you of everything I have said to you. And then further on in John 16, but when he, the spirit of truth, comes, he will guide you into all the truth. He will not speak on his own. He will speak only what he hears, and he will tell you what is yet to come. He will glorify me because it's from me that he will receive what he will make known to you. All that belongs to the Father's mind, that's why I said the Spirit will receive from me what he will make known to you. Again, these things almost overlap, making Jesus known, right? Revealing scripture as to what they're, they're mean to be, revealing what the Father is going to do, because it's all the activity of the Holy Spirit, like all at the same time. I think if we try to slice and dice this and try to say, I only want to learn about these things, and I don't want to do this. I only, I only want to learn about the historical Jesus. I only want to understand scripture. I don't know about the whole, you know, whatever he's doing in, in, in the world today, and it could be weird. You know, there could be tongues, and there could be healings, and, and I don't know about that. I don't think we can slice and dice that. Because whatever he's doing is who he is, right? I, the, one of my favorite jokes is from a, a show, Parks and Rec, where there's this uh, really misogynistic guy who won a, um, an award that was uh, a women's, I, I can't remember exactly what it's called, like the, the Women in Government Award given to And the joke was that he was making a very sarcastic comment, and she said, that doesn't sound like what an award winner would say. And his logic is, Everything I say is what an award winner would say because I have won an award, right? Everything that the Father does is what the Father would do. You want to know what love is? If God is love, look at what the Father's doing. You want to understand what God is about? Look at the activity of the Spirit today. They, they, they can't be separated from themselves. You can't have an academic understanding of the Father and Jesus and the Holy Spirit, put them in their boxes, and divorce it from their real activity engaged in the world today. You can't look back 20 years and say, oh, this is, we can understand everything about God because of what he did during this revival. He's still doing it. Like, this is the same God, the same God that the Israelites are testifying about, the same God that, that set them free from the Exodus. We can't divorce these two works. Reveal to us then the fullness of you, Father. Reveal to us all that you are about. So how this happens, what does this mean like? What, what, what is it, what's the experience of having something revealed to you? Uh, I apologize. I've only had the experience of being me, um, as you only have the experience of being you. And so we only have our own stories from our own firsthand narrative, right? And so whenever people share what it's like for God to move on them, to fall on them, you know, we only have our own experiences. But we also have eyewitness accounts that we can point to and everything like that. Um, I, I hope you hear this very clearly, that there is space in this for the common and the ecstatic experience. There's space in this, in, in the re revealing work of the Holy Spirit. When the Holy Spirit reveals something to you, it could be common and it could be ecstatic. And that's the same Spirit. And I need you to hear that. I, I think this is very important for us. Uh, I think we, we cast our impression sometimes that any encounter that we have with the Holy Spirit has got to look like X. Because this is the only experience that I have. So therefore, if you're not on your knees, you're not experiencing the Holy Spirit. If you're not crying, how do I know that's the Holy Spirit? You know, we have to understand how the world works as the Lord has created it. Uh, this idea that we have of, of being naturally supernatural. I don't think, though, that it's like a divine case of, of, of possession, like Hollywood would, would project. And I don't think it has to be spontaneous. I think sometimes we partner and work, and this gets revealed over time. So uh, I, when I was exploring this for myself to see what the Lord was doing today, I wanted, I was praying hard. Have you ever prayed hard where you're like, you're, sh you're stressing about it, you know? And you're like flexing that much, like, Arr! and so I'm, I'm praying hard, and I'm like, God, come. Like, your teeth are gritted, and you're really pushing through to make something happen. And then you look, and you kind of squint, looking around to see if anything's happened. Like, you know, <laughs> is it just me? Have we all done that? All right. So this was my experience. This is what I'm trying to do. It's like, God, where are you? And all of a sudden, boom, it hit me. It, I, it, again, it's like that you're trying to be the Jedi with the Force. You're trying to make this world fit your will or your expectation of things. But the Lord said, I made this world, and I put you in it to walk in the garden and to enjoy it with you. Why do you think I have to split the sky to, to stop by and say I love you? That's nonsense. I made you. I made your mind. I made your soul so that we could be in communion together. And as soon as I, I realized that the Lord made me to be in communion with me, love just washed over my soul. 
And like the gritting and the work and all the stuff and the squinting, all like which, I, by the way, is literal. I was literally doing those things. It just washed away. And I just knew that I was built. I was designed to be in communion with the Father. He doesn't have to split the sky. There doesn't have to be a cataclysmic event and a meteor strikes down with a handwritten message from God because he made the world so we could be with him. Like, that's why he did this. So, of course, it makes sense that it would be natural and not supernatural all the time. He doesn't have to upset the rules of nature to stop by and say, I love you. That would be nonsense. That would be a really weird, like, alien God who would need to do that. We have a God who made us in his image, right? He's unknowable. He's beyond us. But we're in his image. Let the Holy Spirit reveal that to you. <laughs> so I think we can see this a little bit in Scripture, too. There's some theologians who like to talk about the, the two creation stories. And I think the reason that, that we, we struggle with this is because you have in the beginning of the Bible this God bigger than the cosmos who speaks a word and everything that is becomes. And then you have a scene of him, that same God, walking in the garden, like the size of a man enjoying the cool of the evening. How is that the same? <laughs> like, how do you have, have a God beyond and bigger and, and, and all that, and then walking in the garden? Welcome to the rev revelation of the Holy Spirit, right? Show us how you're doing this. Show us how this is going on. Uh, on, the, on, the other, on the natural side of this as well, I, I've talked about my love for A.W. Tozier. Um, and the reason is, is because I always felt, I, I've said this before, that he was expressing something that, that I, I couldn't find the words to express myself. I think that's doing myself too much credit. I don't think that's what it is. And I was pressing into this week, and, and what I think it is, is when I read A.W. Tozer's books for the first time, The Attributes of God, all these things, which if you haven't read them, I, I encourage you to, it, it, it was a, like something in my soul resonated with it. I don't know that I knew it beforehand. I, I might not have. But something in my soul just cried out saying, oh, yes, that's it. That's, that's, what I, that's, that's my God. I recognize my Jesus in those words. I, I recognize that as, as, as this is being described to me. That's my Jesus. That's what I want this to be about. And, and part of me just rejoiced at this description of my Lord. And that is, I think, is an understanding of this too. That's revelation. It's, it's this light bulb moment. It's this understanding of finally something is starting, the, the picture's coming in clear, right? You've got those binoculars, you're twisting that knob, and then just all of a sudden, the picture comes in clear, and it just clicks, and you can just see it, and you know it. Um, I'll skip the Ava light bulb story. She might not like that story. I'll, I'll, I'll move on. Um, so apart from our personal experiences, we do thankfully have the Word of God. I, I mentioned Paul being blind on the road to Damascus, but I want to read now uh, Acts 8. Now an angel of the Lord said to Philip, Go south to the road, the desert road, that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. So he started out, and on his way he met an Ethiopian eunuch. And it's important, by the way, I think that he was a eunuch. An important official in charge of all the treasury of the Kandake, which means the queen of the Ethiopians. This man had gone to Jerusalem to worship, and on his way home was sitting in his chariot reading the book of Isaiah the prophet. The spirit told Philip, Go to that chariot and stay near it. Then Philip ran up to the chariot and heard the man reading Isaiah the prophet. Do you understand what you're reading, Philip asked? How can I, he said, unless someone explains it to me. So he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. Do you see where scripture is being used to reveal something here? This is the passage of scripture the eunuch was reading. He was led like a sheep to the slaughter, and as a lamb before its shearers is silent, so he did not open his mouth. In his humiliation, he was deprived of justice. Who can speak of his descendants? For his life was taken from the earth. The eunuch asked Philip, tell me, please, who's the prophet talking about himself or someone else? And Philip began with that very passage of scripture and told him the good news about Jesus. Revelation from scripture. The spirit revealing this to us through the eyewitness testimony of what's going on. As they traveled along the road, they came to some water and the eunuch said, look, here's water. What can stand the way of my being baptized? And he gave orders to stop the chariot. Both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water, and Philip baptized him. When they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord suddenly took Philip away, and the eunuch did not see him again, but went on his way rejoicing. Philip, however, appeared at Azotus and traveled about, preaching the gospel in all the towns until he reached the Caesarea. So I love this because you've got a, a, a clear, like almost logical understanding of from Scripture, this is Jesus. 
and then whoop, <laughs> an ecstatic experience of him being taken away, and that's that. And they're combined, right? I, I love the naturally supernatural. Like, it's not all one thing or the other. It's not just reading A.W. Tozier and feeling excitement about the words, and it's not just being taken away and waiting for God to move you by your hair to the next location to do the things. This, this work is, is intertwined. It's not one thing or the other. So, wrapping this thing up, concerns about this. I think an elephant in the room when we talk about Holy Spirit revelation for many of us is that we're afraid of what might get revealed. I know that there, I've been terrified at, at different points in my ages about the prophetic people because I was afraid they could see into my soul, <laughs> right? And they'd be like praying for me then be like, Oh, no. Like, <laughs> I didn't know. No, no. Like, I, I can't continue. I can't pray for this. You know, and we have this fear that, like, our sin will just be revealed and laid bare, right? And that, that it's despicable and, and we'll have the, this malice and this shame and this embarrassment because, oh, no. And I, I think that we fear this. And I'm going to ref- refer us back. If this was like a, 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 a book I was writing, here's a footnote. See previous where the Holy Spirit reveals Jesus. Is his character, is Christ's character such that he wants to embarrass you? Is Christ's character such that he wants to shame you and and drag you through the mud and humiliate you? Is is that the way that he treats the the people that he encountered? Right? So when we have this fear about what the revealing might be, we're not trusting the character of our Lord. It's like we're forgetting again who we're talking about. We're, we're thinking of it as a magic trick again. We're thinking that, that these people just have this ability or something in this. But when the Holy Spirit's revealing something, we can trust his character. Which is why I think whenever we, we pray and, and pause on this stuff, may we do it with actual hopeful expectation. That he has good things for us. That we don't have to be afraid of saying, Lord, would you reveal things for this person? Lord, would, would you move? Would you speak? Would you let things be known? We can trust him. Because he's trustworthy. Because if it's, if it's a person, you might not trust them. But if it's the Holy Spirit doing the revealing, thank God for that. Thank God for the fact that he is a good God with good gifts for us. So here, here's another one. If there's one spirit, and if he is revealing things to us, then why aren't we all on the same page? Oh, okay. I got a lot of notes on this one. No, I don't. Uh, but I have a little bit. How can diligent, God-fearing, God-seeking humans pray and discern things differently? What's going on with this? Again, being limited by my own life and my own experiences, um, I, I want to challenge that assumption a bit. I think we have that understanding, but let me tell you from my lived experience, that doesn't happen as often as you would think. It just hasn't. What I know is when four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten people sit in a room together and discern, and pray about something with the same heart, you know what happens? We're brought to the same page. Like, that, that's my lived experience. Now, I know in church history, you can see divides, you can see these things. I know that that happens. I'm not going to argue the point and say that it never happens, but I am going to say, when I know that we are seeking the Spirit together, when I know that we're in the same room, that there's a, a humble, you know, attitude approaching and, and, and saying that, God, you are sovereign and we will follow you, what I have seen is one Spirit. That's my lived experience. Now, th- I'm, again, I'm not going to say that that's always going to be the case because I, I know enough about history to know that there's challenges to it. But let's keep that in check. Let's not think that we are all, each of us, just discerning and hearing whatever our own ears want to hear. And let's give some credit to the fact that that lived experience actually does matter. All right? Because it may take some time. There may be some detours and distractions along the way. But this is what I have seen. This is what I've witnessed. This is what I love to be a part of is that act of discerning together. Uh, Many of us are aware that this isn't the first vineyard church that I've pastored, Um, and there was this elder that that whenever the the church that I was pastoring um, actually went through a um, terrible time, it was the worst time of my life and and ended up shutting down, Uh, there was two elders left, it was myself and another man, and we were praying to discern, and I clearly heard the Lord say, this church has served its time and it's time to shut it down, and the other elder said, I think we need to fight and keep it going. And I'm like, huh, it's you and me. <laughs> and I, 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 it's funny, he, he asked for a dream, and I didn't know that he asked for a dream, and then I went to sleep and I had a dream. <laughs> and I woke up the next day and I said, I had a dream. He's like, I asked for that. <laughs> and it was a very funny thing. I was like, I don't know what to tell you, but this is what the dream was, and this is how it leads to us closing the church. And, you know, and so he's like, I, I, I just don't have that. So 
What do we do when you have diligent, God-fearing, God-seeking people who don't hear the same things and aren't in agreement about this? So what I decided to do, um, I said, you know, listen, I, I can't go against my conviction, what the Lord's saying. I'm going to cast my vote and, and, and leave the church. So that, that will be like the official business of, of that. And as we are going through that, as we're processing that, the Lord grabbed him and brought us to the same page. Which is a very funny thing, right? Why, what was happening? What was going on? Again, this is my lived experience. I, I, theologically, we could do who knows with this. But I can only share with you what I've known, what I've experienced. The Lord brought us to the same page. There was a process to it, right? I think that that mattered. This was not like you, you go to the Lord, you pull that lever, you get your answer, cha-chink, and then you move on with your life. There had to be this process of engagement, of listening, of discerning, of humility, of going back, of, of sharing this, of, of, of coming with humility and trying to understand this. So I'm not trying to be um, cheeky or, or, or anything when I, I, I throw these out here, but I get great comfort from the fact that in the book of Acts, we have God-fearing, Holy Spirit-filled men casting lots to discern. Okay. Let that sink in that we have God-fearing. They had Pentecost, right? They knew how to hear the, from the Lord. They, they, they walked with Jesus, and then they're like, we want another disciple. Let's cast lots for it. That's in, our, in your Bible, Acts 1. Then they prayed, you, Lord, you know the hearts of all. Show which one of these two you've chosen to take the place in the apostolic ministry from which Judas turned away to go to his own place. They cast lots between Barsabbas and Matthias. The lot fell to Matthias. Uh, by the way, both uh, Barsabbas and Matthias were martyred for their faith. So I don't know if there was a short straw in that one. I, I, I think it was the same thing in both of those ways. But one of my, uh, to answer this, one of my favorite C.S. Lewis quotes is from A Grief Observed. And if you haven't read that book, again, I, I think you, you should. Um, it's just him being very personal. And he says this, Can a mortal ask questions which God finds unanswerable? Quite easily, I should think. All nonsense questions are unanswerable. How many hours are in a mile? Is yellow square or round? Probably half the questions we ask, half of our great theological and metaphysical problems are like that. I think we often ask the wrong questions and then think that the Holy Spirit's not at work. We are so concerned with my life, with my priorities. D let me ask you this. Did there have to be a 12th apostle? I mean, I'm not going to, that's a whole other theological thing. But maybe they're asking the wrong questions. The Lord's not concerned about that. He's like, why are you limiting it to 12? <laughs> like, why not both? Like, <laughs> everybody go and do this. Like, why, why, are you tr why are you obsessed with the number 12? You're like, let's move on with this. And again, opinion, don't, don't take that to the, don't write a book and say, Josh said that, that no, don't, don't do that. But I think that we ask the wrong questions. And then we get confused and frustrated that we're not hearing. Oh, my goodness, Lord, would you just be as you are? Reveal whatever you would to me that we can go from this place. I think we rush at God with a half-baked plan. Okay, God, you said this, but what if this thing happens? We want to get our contingency plans in effect. And then we go, what, what are we going to do? What, if, if this happens, God, what are you going to do? And then we don't hear from the Lord. And we're like, God, you're not speaking to me. Well, what are you asking him? <laughs> like, are, are, you, are you hearing from what he's actually saying, or are you just bringing up, like, nonsense questions and asking him how many hours are in a mile? I have found, again, my lived experience is God is faithful to this. When we come to him with humble submission, when we say, Lord, your will, your plans, I want to know your voice. I, I know he speaks. Again, I could argue about the whys and the theology of this whole thing, but this is the lived experience of what I know the Lord does. When I pester God with my worries and my anxieties, I think that's what I'm doing. I'm asking him unanswerable questions. God, what if you don't show up? What do you mean if I don't show up? <laughs> God, what if you don't do this? Did I tell you I'm going to do it? Like, like, why do we do this to him? But we do. I think it's important that we understand who he is and who we're coming to. I don't need a logical answer to all of my questions. I need the face of Jesus revealed to me. If I'm coming for an answer of logic, but I see Jesus and I get peace, that's often the better answer.